can see exactly how good my Photoshop skills are in this picture. And uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'm in only one of two countries. This is about 10 years ago. One of two countries, so you can guess which one is it. Don't be shy, countries that we have wars with, at least the US does. Afghanistan, that's right. This is the, uh, on the tarmac of the airport in Kabul. So uh, in my career at CIA, I had uh, uh, you know, various parts of the world that I worked on. I was an analyst, so my job is to use information to make sense of the world. And um, in the 1980s, I worked on South Africa, South Africa, and uh, very exciting topic, very interesting topic. Um, I eventually led the South African team, and we were trying to figure out if the transition to black majority rule, when it would occur, and could it occur peacefully. And the team was equally divided into two camps. Those who thought that the transition to black majority rule would be like a civil war, it would be bloody and horrible, and those who thought that it could occur more or less peacefully, and that we were already beginning to see the signs of that transition. And this is 1985, 1986. And uh, I was the chief of that team. That was my second management job. And I, tried, I was kept trying to figure out, you know, we are all very good. The people that were hired were very smart. We were equally divided in terms of gender. We were uh, age. Uh, they all worked for a wonderful boss, me. Uh, we all had the exact same information. We sat in the same room. You know, if truth can really be discerned, why were we so divided? And uh, this was like my number one management issue, managing that division of thought. Any, any ideas? Uh, why? I eventually came up with an explanation uh, that satisfied me, whether or not it was true, but it satisfied me. Any thoughts? Why would a group of people be so divided when all the externalities were the same about, about an idea? Any thoughts? Related, personal history. It was kind of a bias. It wasn't heritage. It was, any other thoughts? Yes. What does that mean, theory X, theory Y? Good or? You're right, you're right. Basically, it's, it's whether or not they were optimists or pessimists, by fundamentally by nature. So, and the way I, I uh, figured that out is one of the ones who was in the it's gonna be horrible camp, uh, she was trying to get Bruce Springsteen tickets. The 1980s, it was the Born in the USA tour. And there was a radio competition back when people listened to radio, and they drew her name but for some reason, she wasn't in the car and she didn't hear her name. But we heard it in the office, and when she came in, we said, oh, Karen, Karen, you won, you have to call in. Oh, no, it's over. And she goes, I knew it. I knew that was going to happen to me. And I went, oh, she's really a pessimist about everything. And that was a very, that fit. You know, I'm an optimist, so I thought that we were going to have a peaceful transition. So that... I think was the first moment I really began to think about thinking. How do we think? What is thinking about? So my career at CI was much more about how do we think well? What are the habits of good thinkers than it was about you know, any particular part of the world? So uh, there's two books where um, some of my experience at CIA is detailed one I co-wrote with Lois Kelly, Rebels at Work. Uh, and um, I'm going to talk about that later today, about being a change agent and surviving as a change agent. And the other is by Adam Grant, the very prominent business writer. And it's uh, where he talks about my career at the agency as well. Now, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is actually based on my experience, my extensive readings, because this became kind of my focus professionally, and also from information in these two books, uh, The Diversity Bonus by Scott Page. He's a business professor, 
the University of Michigan, I think, in the US. And this other book, which is actually from Australia, is a textbook, is really boring, costs a lot of money, uh, rebels, rebels in groups, and talks a lot about how difference, it kind of summarizes all the recent academic work and studies, most of which probably can't be replicated, but never mind, uh, about how uh, differences of opinion make teams better, not worse. So I was talking to someone just last night, a, a, a fellow attendee, who asked me what I was going to talk about, and I said, you know, diversity of thought, and then I said, well, probably, you know, everyone here at this conference accepts the importance of diversity of thought, and he said, I don't think so. So I'm, I'm quoting this person, right? So you shouldn't assume that. Well, luckily, I had already inserted these uh, screenshots into my uh, presentation, where just when I was just on Twitter, I came across this tweet, and I'm going to show you parts of the thread. So this guy, and I don't mask his name because he may still be looking for applicants. You can see it's just a few days old. So he's trying to get a more complete, I would say, a more complete applicant pool for his position. And immediately, the flame wars begin on Twitter. Uh, some, and uh, and uh, I've obliterated everyone's names except his because I don't necessarily want to be publicized. Uh, so, of course, what's wrong with white males? And he says, nothing. I mean, I like white males. He, he probably is one, I guess, right? But he's looking for a more complete applicant pool. And then um, someone else gives him another advice, just say, you don't want males or whites. And he says, no, that's, that's not what I, what I said. And then this uh, other person jumps in to defend him. And then this other person actually offers another useful aspect of diversity. <laughs> Can I work remotely, right? That's particularly, how many people work remotely? Yeah, I mean, the, remote work actually is a kind of diverse, it, it provides a sort of diverse input into the workplace. And uh, finally, my favorite, which I can't decide whether it's as stupid as it seems, or it's just like expert trolling, you know, great use of irony. This person, if your English is good enough, uh, which I think almost everyone he uses, people who know nothing about cyber, as in to know, but instead know. So I don't know, did he do that on purpose? Is he being clever or just dense? I, I don't know. So how many of you have experienced or know of this kind of phenomenon in in your, in your domain, where you do not get a uh, complete, uh, diverse applicant pool. So I would say, if you're honest, most of you know of or have experienced this. Now, to get a little bit closer to, to my domain, my experience, because I know nothing about developing, um, I... Um, came across this tweet where this is the picture is of the US Defense Secretary of State and all the prominent China advisors that he had assembled for a conference on China. And this woman is, you know, respecting the knowledge base of these experts, nevertheless sad that that they're all wearing ties, right? <laughs> that 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 this is their uh, homogeneous nature. So I retweeted that, and then this, this person comes along and says, American is the only background which matters. Meritocracy, I can't tell, the he, is he saying meritocracy is greater than diversity? Is, is, you think that, rather than leading to diversity. And uh, let me just say something about meritocracy. Almost all the standards, not all of them, but let's say many, if not most of the standards, around which meritocracies are based are subjective in one way or another. They have some basis in subjectivity. So, um, but that's not actually the, uh, the topic of my talk. So I want to talk, now start talking about sort of the science of diverse thinking. So are you with me? Are we good? So you may, again, this, these may be the things you already know about. So. For example, you know, diverse thinking, there's lots and lots of studies that show diverse thinking, the more 
diverse an organization is, either, uh, and here I'm talking about legacy diversity, identity diversity, and I'm gonna distinguish that from diversity of thought later, but that um, diverse thinking correlates to better outcomes. To my knowledge, the causality of that linkage has not been determined, but study after study shows that if you have um, more women on the board or more ethnic diversity in a team, that you can outperform teams that are ho more homogeneous. This has occurred in the financial industry. This has occurred in terms of the profits of corporations based on the diversity of their board composition. There's also a study by, I think, the Boston Consulting Group that shows that companies that have diverse boards have, uh, or diverse uh, management staffs have 20% more of their revenues linked to innovation. Now, exactly how would diversity contribute to innovation? And I think, you know, there's a lot of talk about what innovation is, but Unless you're a genius and are having a breakthrough idea of you know, tremendous imagination, a lot of diversity can come, or sorry, a lot of innovation can come simply from combining multiple ideas into a new synthesis, right? So Gutenberg, for example, he invented the printing press, and there were two existing technologies that he was inspired by or observed that led him to come up with the idea of the printing press. Any thoughts as to what those were? So he combined the concept of a coin press. Coins were being minted with a wine press. Grapes were being pressed to come up with this idea of a printing press. I, I like to think of innovation, or a, a, a big part of innovation is really when ideas have sex with each other, right? When they intermingle and have new offspring. So uh, diversity correlates to better outcomes, but to be clear, the causality has not been proven. And, and there are, in fact, some examples, and I'm gonna talk about this later, where diversity of thought or diversity of inputs actually can lead to uh, worse outcomes, can lead to a deterioration in results in some situations, and I have a theory to explain that. Diversity leads to better outcomes even when dissenters are wrong. So I hear, I hear this a lot, uh, have heard this a lot historically, that, you know, they're just gonna, these people with different opinions, they're wrong. And why should I have to listen them or, or to them or take them into consideration? But the research shows, and this is particularly based on several studies from that research in groups, uh, rebels in groups that I showed you, that even when the dissenters to the prevailing opinion are shown to be wrong, that their contribution to the overall effort led to a better outcome. Now, what dynamic do you think is at play there? What's going on that could explain why that happens? Any thoughts? Yes, you have to explain your ideas better. You end up, were you sitting next to me early this morning? Hi, how are you? Yeah. Uh, you, uh, you, you work harder to explain your ideas, and therefore you actually make your idea better. If you weren't challenged, that effort would not have occurred. And who knows, I, I think another explanation is that even though the dissenters may have been overall incorrect, there may have been elements to their thinking which actually made your idea better. And that actually gets me to the third point, which diverse thinking outperforms even the smartest experts. Anybody know who this woman is in this picture? When someone shows up a slide and they talk about the smartest person in the world, whose picture is usually there? 
Einstein. I mean, I've yet to talk to a group where they don't immediately say Einstein, right? And I, I'm kind of making a macro point here um, about how the images that we use perpetuate homogeneity of thinking, and that if we just work a little bit harder, we could be more inclusive in the examples that we use. So this woman is Cecilia Payne. She was the first woman to get a PhD in astronomy from Harvard. She's actually English, a uh, British uh, citizen. And she came to Harvard because she thought, or to the US, because she thought she'd have a better chance of advancing her studies than in, in Great Britain. And she discovered what uh, stars are made of. She, you know, one of the great advances in astronomy, a topic that I, it's like an amateur interest of mine because it's such a great example of thinking. You know, cosmologists are just thinking, right? Using little shards of evidence to come up with ideas. Um, it wasn't until we married photography to uh, telescopes, to observatories, that we started to make advances in astronomy. Because if you think about it, until you married the photograph with the telescope, it was just what one person saw with their naked eye. There was no record of it. In fact, they would make a drawing of it. And so you couldn't study patterns, and you couldn't accumulate knowledge over time. But once, and I'm spending some time on this point because it's going to come back. Um, it wasn't until you could take pictures of everything the telescope saw and then analyze them over periods of time that people began to notice things like the different colors of stars. And it was the different color spectrum that stars inhabit that allowed Cecilia Payne to make these brilliant deductions about what stars are made of. And that's, you know, a very smart person. Now, even the, she, however, could have been outsmarted or her performance improved uh, with, I would contend, with other people around her. And in fact, she was part of a team. So a good example of where diversity outperforms even the smartest expert is the Netflix challenge, which I think most of you are familiar with. Netflix offered a million dollar prize, I don't know, 10 years ago for people who could improve its recommendation engine by a certain percentage. There was, you had to meet the target. And the top performer had improved it the most, but could not get over that threshold. It wasn't until he or she combined, in other words, the top three or four teams combined together and worked together that they actually get over the threshold and were able to split the million dollar prize. So generally thinking, even if you're the smartest person in the room, your outcome will be better if you work with other thinkers. Now, here I have a question mark. Diversity is less important for routine tasks. And that's something that's, if you recall that book, The Diversity Bonus by Scott Page, that's something that he argues in that book. And, you know, I, I can't think of a more routine task than mopping, using a mop. And in the last 15 years, mopping has been reinvented. Right, you have all these little gadgets with the liquids and everything and the dust. So I, I actually think that things that we think are routine can actually be rethought. And, and we're seeing a lot of that actually because of technology. Now, uh, another point that I wanna make about diverse thinking, I have to introduce that point by talking a little bit about the streetlight effect. Now, who knows what the streetlight effect is? You've, you, no, I'm not gonna let you because you've, you've already answered. Yes, you. He's, yes. Yes, he's looking for his keys in the only place he can see under the streetlight. Well, that's kind of what information is. If you think about it, when, and I thought about this a lot when, during my career at CIA, we would have a certain body of information, and we made the assumption that that information accurately reflected reality. Did it? No. 
Did we know the delta between what we knew and reality? Did we have a way of measuring that? No. So we tend to look where the light shines, where we have information. We assume it's reality, and it isn't. So our tools for knowing, remember that discussion about cosmology? Our tools and methods of, for knowing, our ability to know anything, is a function of our tools and methods for knowing. And at any given time in history, during our period of, of study of a problem, we can assume that we've reached the acme, we know everything there is to know. And almost always, that's wrong. There's more to know, but we have not developed the tools yet. So your ability to know is a function of your tools and methods for knowing. And a method to increase your bandwidth for knowing is to have diversity of thought on your team. Now, uh, there's a, uh, a guy who won the Nobel Prize for physics and uh, for uh, discovering exoplanets just this year. And he uh, speculates that we will find evidence of life, or we will find life in other, elsewhere, in other planets, in other places in the universe by 2050. And he, they asked him, why does he think that? And he said, because the new generation of tools that we've got going out on the galactic explorers and in the new array of telescopes is gonna be such a significant shift change in capability that I think we're gonna find it. So that's, you know, I think an ultimate reason why diversity of thought is important, because it expands your method of knowing. So I said earlier that traditional identity diversity is, is correlated to diversity of thought, but that's not the only uh, source of diversity of thought. Uh, we as individuals have different thinking styles. And neuroscience is only now beginning to understand our different thinking styles. So uh, I'm, you know, kind of stereotypically horrible at math. I've been playing bridge recently. Anybody play bridge? It's a card game. I find it's not very popular uh, anymore with, with with different generations. But one of the things that's really good at bridge, really important, is to memorize the cards. And I keep trying to memorize the cards, and I can't. I have very good verbal skills, but I can't, I, for the life of me, I can't memorize the cards. But when I play bridge, what I've learned to do is, rather than not memorize the cards, just feel the cards. I've stopped memorizing, and I, I start kind of intuiting, and it works better for me when I just let whatever that aspect of my brain inform my thinking about card playing rather than, you know, rote and obvious memorization. So unfortunately, there are no really excellent cognitive style tests that I know of. And if anyone knows of any, let me know. Um, there are, this one, I'm not recommending it, but I'm making it available to you all. One, because it's free. Two, because it takes 15 minutes. Three, because you can score it yourself. And four, because when I've used it with teams that I'm, for example, uh, exploring analytic methods with, that it has, you know, anecdotally, it has come out with different results. So, for example, in that uh, list of thinkers, any guess as to what kind of thinker I am? I've already told you a little bit about myself. Any, any guess as to which one of these I turn out to be when I take it? Very consistently. Ab abstract? Abstract random. Abstract random, com com kind of completely abstract random thinker. Um, and I feel it. That's exactly who I am. So 
it, actually, I wouldn't mind. You could probably take it in 15 minutes while I'm talking. Uh, get two channels of your mind going. The only thing is you need pencil and paper. The link is, you know, doesn't take you, it's kind of analog. It doesn't actually take you to something where you can take the test online. But it's very simple and it's kind of fun. Okay, you still with me? All right, all right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the art of diverse thinking. So if you have, well, let me say one more thing. I think the few, about the previous point, I think the future of human relations, human capital, talent management, is in helping us form teams of sort of super, super teams of well-balanced cognitive styles to solve problems. The CIA, we would have to have a team to think about the future of Iran. And we selected that team, frankly, in a kind of haphazard way. And it would have been a lot better if we had had a way of identifying, you know, these are very imaginative thinkers, uh, these are more linear thinkers, because you need them all. No thinking style is better. They're just unique, they just offer unique contributions. So that's what, where I think uh, human capital needs to go, although I see very, li very little sign that it's going there. So, the art of diverse thinking. So, there are certain aspects, I said that I was going to concentrate on how we can harvest these different styles of thinking more effectively. So, how many of you have some kind of leadership responsibility or team leading responsibility? Yeah, so ab about a third of you. And a lot of what I'm going to say is really, I, th I, I believe, hopeful just uh, collegially, just in terms of relationships with your coworkers. So it's, it's important when you have a diverse team to, you know, the phrase, work out loud, collaborate from the beginning. And I know I dealt, I didn't write code really, but I, I, we wrote assessments, we, we wrote analysis. And you might be the expert and you might have a, a bunch of coworkers and the habit always was to share your paper after you had finished writing it and then you would send it out for coordination. That's what we called it. And at that point, when you have finished writing, how receptive are you to other ideas? Not very. And in fact, usually you underestimate, probably on purpose, the amount of time you need for effective coordination and input. So what you have to do is do this from the beginning. Bless you work out loud, collaborate as early in the process as you can. Because otherwise, you don't have collaboration, you just have deconfliction, which is never very effective. Don't demand courage from diverse thinkers. This is like a pathology in organizations. And I'm talking again at four, and I'm almost like my entire talk at, at four is about this topic, right? Uh, Managers and leaders and even colleagues often, without knowing, everybody agrees this is the right way to proceed. And if you have a different opinion, you have to be brave to express it, right? And you, you have to find ways to avoid that phenomenon, to avoid that, that a phenomenon, to avoid that pressure on, on people. Watch your language when you're a colleague, or a leader in terms of harvesting diversity of thought. So time for interaction again. So some of these phrases, I, I know my, most of you are not probably native English speakers, so I don't know what your, the analogs are for these phrases, but I bet some of these are familiar. They're very, for the first one, you know, any comments or questions, or I have an open door policy. Very, very common thing for a manager to say. How many of you have heard that phrase, I have an open door policy? Or, hey, don't bring me a problem unless you have a solution, right? Now, I think all of these phrases are toxic when it comes to harvesting diversity of thought. Anyone have, can, agree with me and can tell me, yes, go ahead. No, I don't agree. Oh, okay, but do you, okay, can point out an example. You're green, okay, so, yes. Yes. 
yeah, let's reach consensus. Like, if everybody agrees but you, and you know, manager says, hey, I have a consensus decision-making style, you have to be really courageous to present your objection, right? So uh, let me just go through. Any comments or questions? Very typical at the end of a presentation. When someone says any comments or questions, do you get any? No. Usually you get crickets, right? Uh, it's usually the sign the meeting is over. So you as a leader or as a colleague can be much more direct in inviting a different opinion by just asking something like, well, what did I get wrong? Or what am I missing? Or how would you do it differently? Um, oh, don't bring me problems without solutions. You're the NASA scientist. You have discovered the asteroid that's going to hit the Earth. But you don't say anything because you don't know how to stop it. It's ridiculous, right? But that's what you're telling people. If you're a team, the person that's got the talent, maybe he's a concrete sequential thinker, and he's got the talent or she's got the talent to identify the problem, may not have the imagination to come up with the solution, but heck, that's okay, right? Aren't, aren't we a team? Uh, I have an open door policy, I hate that. If you have to, if you as a leader, can you tell I'm passionate about this? If you as a leader have to say you have an open door policy, that's a sign that you do not have an open door policy. It, it, it need not be said, right? You're like constantly talking to the people you work with or around and say, hey, what's the one thing I could do to make your job easier? That's what someone who's really inviting uh, differences of opinion says. Uh, very, very common in a meeting, you're on a tight deadline, someone says something like, um, you know, makes a really valid point, but you just don't have enough time to deal with it. So the person will say, well, let's take that offline. But everyone else hears it as, well, you know, she doesn't want to talk about that. So be very specific. Say, hey, let, we need to talk about that later. How about like 4 o'clock this afternoon? Are you available? Just that little small thing will let everyone know that you're listening to their differences of opinion, and then let's reach consensus. You know, you know, the only thing we need to have consensus about is the process by which we manage disagreement. That's important. But you need, and then everyone has to be able to live with the outcome if there is a disagreement. But you cannot, I think, have decision making be consensus based and also harvest diversity of thought. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about is this idea that I've already been hinting about is that there is this phenomenon that when you have diversity of thought, you also have diversity tension. So when, you know, one reason why organizations and humans like homogeneity is that there's less conflict there's less diversity of tension. So unless you can manage diversity ten tension, which most managers do not know how to do, there's not a, how to, there's not a lot of literature about this yet, uh, you're, not, you're gonna not be able to get full advantage of the diversity of thought in your team. And that, to get back to a point I made at, right at the beginning, that's one of the reasons why it's very difficult to prove the benefits causally of diversity of thought, either it being legacy diversity or what I'm talking about more is cognitive diversity, is that the fact that the, that the teams don't manage well that tension, don't know how to disagree productively, dilutes the, the impact of diversity of ideas. So one of the things you have to do is encourage productive conflict, which is, you know, like, nice, but, but how do you do that? And, and I don't have all the answers, but I've, I've harvested a few suggestions. As I said earlier, when I was talking about the consensus point, you have to agree on how to disagree. You have to establish ground rules about how you handle conflict and, that, and disagreement, and that has to be made clear, and people have to agree to it. Uh, from the beginning. Uh, avoid the narcissism of small differences. This is a Freudian term. And a lot of times in a, in a group, you may agree on your ultimate goal, on your ultimate objective, but you disagree about how to get there. 
And that disagreement about how to get there can like destroy the entire team unity, right? And that is called the narcissism, narcissism, narcissism of small differences. So I think you have to be aware and kind of call time out. Hey, don't we still agree on the ultimate goal? So let's not let, our, let, let's not let this get nuclear just because we disagree on methods. Analyze why there is disagreement. This often happens where people disagree about something, but they don't know why they disagree. So I may disagree with you because you know more than I do. Or you may disagree with me because you've got a piece of information that I don't have. So you need to think about, okay, you know, information, expertise, experience. What are the different basis for disagreement and explore each one? And that leads me to the final one, with, which is empathize with the opposing points of view. What I mean by that is that often when we have a disagreement with another person, we characterize what they think using words that they would not use themselves. So in the US, there's lots of Trump supporters. And I'm not one of them. And when I talk about a Trump supporter, I might say, well, he's a racist or she's a racist. But it's unlikely that that's, what they, that's a word that they use about themselves. So, and when they look at me, they're, they're going to say, well, she's just a tree hugger. And that's not a phrase that I use about myself. So you empathize by actually describing the other person's point of view using the words that they themselves use. And I think that will help you understand why you disagree more clearly. It, it, you know, in politics, this is not going to solve the problem, but hopefully in areas of conflict over, over what you're doing at work, this is gonna be, have greater impact. And in my last slide, I, I talked about this uh, topic two years ago at something called Chicago Camps which is a kind of a fun software developers conference in, in Chicago. And uh, there was a developer who listened to my talk and she tweeted this out. And uh, she's actually in uh, Canada. Uh, and she had this code of conduct for her teams. And afterwards, she told me uh, she was going to add those too. So I, you know, given the audience I'm talking to, I thought I would in include that here. Uh, and of course, this works for all teams, but I, I think it's some really good ground rules for uh, a code of conduct for a team when you want to have vibrant and productive differences of thinking and opinion. And with that, I am done. And thank you very much.